Part 2, Chapter 14 Okonkwo was well received by his mother's kinsman in Mbanta. The old man who received him was his mother's younger brother, who was now the eldest surviving member of that family. His name was Uchendu, and it was he who received Okonkwo's mother twenty and ten years before, when she had been brought home from Umwofia to be buried with her people. Okonkwo was only a boy then, and Uchendu still remembered him crying the traditional farewell, Mother, mother, mother is going. That was many years ago. Today Okonkwo was not bringing his mother home to be buried with other people. He was taking his family of three wives and eleven children to seek refuge in his motherland. As soon as Uchendu saw him with his sad and weary company, he guessed what had happened and asked no questions. It was not until the following day that Okonkwo told him the full story. The old man listened silently to the end, and then said with some relief, It is a female Ochu, and he arranged the requisite rites and sacrifices. Okonkwo was given a plot of ground on which to build his compound, and two or three pieces of land on which to farm during the coming planting season. With the help of his mother's kinsmen, he built himself an obi and three huts for his wives. He then installed his personal god and the symbols of his departed fathers. Each of Uchendu's five sons contributed three hundred seed yams to enable their cousin to plant a farm, for as soon as the first rain came, farming would begin. At last the rain came. It was sudden and tremendous. For two or three moons the sun had been gathering strength till it seemed to breathe a breath of fire on the earth. All the grass had long been scorched brown, and the sands felt like live coals to the feet. Evergreen trees wore a dusty coat of brown. The birds were silenced in the forest, and the world lay panting under the live, vibrating heat. And then came the clap of thunder. It was an angry, metallic, and thirsty clap, unlike the deep and liquid rumbling of the rainy season. A mighty wind rose and filled the air with dust. Palm trees swayed as the wind combed their leaves into flying crests like strange and fantastic coiffure. When the rain finally came, it was in large, solid drops of frozen water which the people called the nuts of the water of heaven. They were hard and painful on the body as they fell, yet young people ran about happily picking up the cold nuts and throwing them into their mouths to melt. The earth quickly came to life, and the birds in the forests fluttered around and chirped merrily. A vague scent of life and green vegetation was diffused in the air. As the rain began to fall more soberly and in smaller liquid drops, children sought for shelter, and all were happy, refreshed, and thankful. Okonkwo and his family worked very hard to plant a new farm, but it was like beginning life anew without the vigor and enthusiasm of youth like learning to become left-handed in old age. Work no longer had for him the pleasure it used to have, and when there was no work to do, he sat in a silent half-sleep. His life had been ruled by a great passion, to become one of the lords of the clan. That had been his life spring, and he had all but achieved it. Then everything had been broken. He had been cast out of his clan like a fish onto a dry, sandy beach, panting, Clearly his personal god or chi was not made for great things. A man could not rise beyond the destiny of his chi. The saying of the elders was not true, that if a man said yea, his chi also affirmed. Here was a man whose chi said nay, despite his own affirmation. The old man, Uchendu, saw clearly that Okonkwo had yielded to despair, and he was greatly troubled. He would speak to him after the Isaifi ceremony. The youngest of Uchendu's five sons, Amikwu, was marrying a new wife. The bride price had been paid, and all but the last ceremony had been performed. Amikwu and his people had taken palm wine to the bride's kinsmen about two moons before Okonkwo's arrival in Mbanta, and so it was time for the final ceremony of confession. The daughters of the family were all there, some of them having come a long way from their homes in distant villages, Uchendu's eldest daughter had come from Abodo, nearly half a day's journey away. The daughters of Uchendu's brothers were also there. 
There was a full gathering of Umuwada, in the same way as they would meet if a death occurred in the family. There were twenty-two of them. They sat in a big circle on the ground, and the bride sat in the center with a hen in her right hand. Uchendu sat by her, holding the ancestral staff of the family. All the other men stood outside the circle, watching. Their wives watched also. It was evening, and the sun was setting. Uchendu's eldest daughter, Njida, asked the questions. Remember that if you do not answer truthfully, you will suffer or even die at childbirth, she began. How many men have lain with you since my brother first expressed the desire to marry you? None, she replied simply. Answer truthfully, urged the other women. None, asked Njidi. None, she answered. Swear on this staff of my father's, said Uchendu. I swear, said the bride. Uchendu took the hen from her, slit its throat with a sharp knife, and allowed some of the blood to fall on his ancestral staff. From that day, Amiku took the young bride to his hut, and she became his wife. The daughters of the family did not return to their homes immediately, but spent two or three days with their kinsmen. On the second day, Uchendu called together his sons and daughters and his nephew, Okonkwo. The men brought their goatskin mats, with which they sat on the floor, and the women sat on a sisal mat spread on a raised bank of earth. Uchendu pulled gently at his grey beard and gnashed his teeth. Then he began to speak, quietly and deliberately, picking his words with great care. It is a conquo that I primarily wish to speak to, he began, but I want all of you to note what I am going to say. I am an old man, and you are all children. I know more about the world than any of you. If there is anyone among you who thinks he knows more, let him speak up. He paused, but no one spoke. Why is a conquo with us today? This is not his clan. We are only his mother's kinsmen. He does not belong here. He is an exile, condemned for seven years to live in a strange land. And so he is bowed with grief. But there is just one question I would like to ask him. Can you tell me, Okonkwo, why it is that one of the commonest names we give our children is Unneka, or Mother is Supreme? We all know that a man is the head of the family, and his wives do his bidding. A child belongs to its father and his family, and not to its mother and her family. A man belongs to his fatherland, and not to his motherland. And yet we say, Unneka, mother is supreme. Why is that? There was silence. I want a conquo to answer me, said Uchendu. I do not know the answer, Okonkwo replied. You do not know the answer. So you see that you are a child. You have many wives and many children, more children than I have. You are a great man in your clan, but you are still a child. My child. Listen to me and I shall tell you. But there is one more question I shall ask you. Why is it that when a woman dies she is taken home to be buried with her own kinsmen? She is not buried with her husband's kinsmen. Why is that? Your mother was brought home to me and buried with my people. Why was that? A conquo shook his head. He does not know that either, said Uchendu. And yet he is full of sorrow because he has come to live in his motherland for a few years. <laughs> he laughed, a mirthless laughter and turned to his sons and daughters. What about you? Can you answer my question? They all shook their heads. Then listen to me, he said, and cleared his throat. It's true that a child belongs to its father, but when a father beats his child, it seeks sympathy in its mother's hut. A man belongs to his fatherland when things are good and life is sweet. 
but when there is sorrow and bitterness, he finds refuge in his motherland. Your mother is there to protect you. She is buried there, and that is why we say that mother is supreme. Is it right that you, O Konkwo, should bring to your mother a heavy face and refuse to be comforted? Be careful, or you may displease the dead. Your duty is to comfort your wives and children and take them back to your fatherland after seven years. But if you allow sorrow to weigh you down and kill you, they will all die in exile. He paused for a long while. These are now your kinsmen. He waved at his sons and daughters. You think you are the greatest sufferer in the world. Do you know that men are sometimes banished for life? Do you know that men sometimes lose all their yams and even their children? I had six wives once. I have none now except that young girl who knows not her right from her left. Do you know how many children I have buried? Children I begot in my youth and strength? Twenty-two. I did not hang myself, and I am still alive. If you think you are the greatest sufferer in the world, ask my daughter, Akueni, how many twins she has borne and thrown away. Have you not heard the song they sing when a woman dies? For whom is it well, for whom is it well? There is no one for whom it is well. I have no more to say to you. <laughs>